you. It's exciting to be here um, and to um, have this many people show up, um, hopefully interested in the situation with refugees. Now, can you hear me okay in the back? <clears throat> if at some point you can't hear me, just wave, okay? Sometimes my voice will dip down. Um, so today I want to talk to you about the refugee crisis. And I'm not, I'm not here as an expert. I'm here based on experiences that I've had. Um, but I want to talk to you um, some about what I have learned about refugees. Um, to tell you a little bit about our organization, let me say, a little bit about our organization, define what a refugee is, and then tell you some about why do they leave their countries, how do they leave their countries, and what's the situation now, what are their future, and why should we care? And most of this is based on my personal experience. First of all, E3 Partners has been in the ministry for 31 years. We're a church planting organization. Our, um, our ministry is focused on making sure that there are churches available, not the building, but the people. Churches available to every community, every person on the planet. And we have uh, a pretty a pretty comprehensive ministry of short-term trips. We have about 150 a year with close to 2,000 people going uh, all over the world, 58, 60 countries that we go to. And we also have long-term workers that are in the field in Asia and Africa and the Middle East and Europe that are there for two or more years. We have master trainers training people in discipleship, church planting, some of you may recognize I Am Second, which is um, a series of videos that share the gospel. <clears throat> so that's just a little nutshell on who we are. When I was in, in Greece in 2016, I was on the Isle on Mytilene. Those of you who are Bible scholars may have heard the name Mytilene. The Apostle Paul went there. Um, Lesbos Island is one of the places many refugees come to as they are escaping their countries. And I was, I was standing there looking out over the GNC, over to the horizon where Turkey was. There was a Syrian refugee standing there who was actually a volunteer. And he said, this is the epicenter of humanity. And I was what? He said, yeah, the refugee crisis is the epicenter of humanity. And I want you to think about that. This little snapshot here is uh, showing a flow from Africa and the Middle <coughs> East into Europe. This is, all, this is people representing all kinds of people coming in, just seeking asylum. In 1951, the, in the Geneva Convention, they defined the refugee as one who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted because of their religious beliefs, political beliefs, any kind of beliefs that they have, uh, their social life. It's one who, because of that fear, is either unwilling are unable to return to their home country, the country where they live. I had another refugee, and a lot of what you'll see here is about Syrian refugees, because that's the majority of them that we've served. But this one said, we fled because we were certain that what lay ahead of us was much better than what we left behind. And think about that. Where you live today, leaving where you were, because somewhere else was much better for you. And this is a picture of one refugee family as they're um, trying to get out of their country. Here's some statistics that come from the United Nations. Most of the statistics here come from the United Nations and World Vision. Two-thirds of all refugee countries, refugees come from these five countries. Syria, there's about 6.3 million. These numbers I pulled about three weeks ago, right before I left to go out of the country. And Afghanistan, 2.6 million. Sudan, Sudanese, South Sudanese, this one is rising. Myanmar, this one is also rising. And then Somalia. <clears throat> Most of them travel through Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, Jordan. They come into countries like Greece and Germany. They're looking for asylum in these countries of like Italy, Spain, Germany, and Greece. Germany has accepted probably the most refugees as far as giving them asylum. And this is Middle Eastern refugees that I'm primarily talking about, although we have refugees from all over the world. <clears throat> Never before in human history have there been so many displaced people. 
I'll tell you that it's very complicated. It's To me, it's personal, it's spiritual, it's also economic, and it's also political. But we're not going to get into the political side of it today. Uh, well, that would be another discussion another day. But if you can see from the 1st of 2017 to the 1st of this year, how the, how, what the jump is in displaced people from around the world. This graph comes from UNHRC, 68.5 million forcibly displaced people. Of that, 25.4 million are known refugees. And I say known refugees because sometimes refugees come into the country, they slip into a country and they're not documented, so the country doesn't really know how many are there. <clears throat> One person is force, forcibly displaced every two seconds. So you think how long you've been in this room and how many are forcibly displaced across the world. <clears throat> These are the ones that tear my heart up, the children. 52% of all refugees, 25.4 million refugees, 52% of the refugees are children. This is up from two years ago from 50% to 52%. They're under the age of 18. 22% of those children are unaccompanied. They do not have a family or a known friend with them. And you can just let your mind imagine the dangers that they are in from human traffickers, from all kinds of abuse. Um, this is a real critical <coughs> issue right now. <clears throat> Why do you think they fled their homes? The number one reason is war and persecution. And if you look at the countries from which they come and keep with the news, then you understand <clears throat> to some degree about the war and persecution. I'm going to tell you some stories today about some of that persecution that they've gone through. It's also because of human rights. Those are the top two reasons that people leave their countries. <clears throat> this is kind of a gross picture, but I want to share about this little boy. He's nine years old. His parents are Afghani. And um, a radical militant group came and kidnapped the son, nine years old. They beat him. They abused him. They tortured him. Um, they came back to his parents and required thousands and thousands and thousands of U.S. dollars. Not U.S., but their own money that they didn't have. Thankfully, friends and family helped um, get the money to get him um, back from the kidnappers. But the kidnappers kept threatening them and that they were going to come after the rest of the family. We were in Athens last year and last May with a medical team and the family came to our medical team. The little boy's arm, they had x-rays. The little boy's arm is, I think if he came to the States or to Germany for surgery they probably could fix his arm, but it's it's shattered, the bone here in this arm. This was the worst of his injuries, um, other than emotional injuries. There's a steel bar in there and that's kind of a hook that you see there coming out of it. It was infected badly infected. Um, he was malnourished. The whole family was malnourished. And um, so our team was able to clean the wound really, really good, teach mom and dad how to keep it clean. We gave them the supplies they needed. We gave them antibiotics. We loved on them and prayed for them. We helped them get some clothing and some food that they needed. And then we got them in touch with a, a Greek doctor who has promised to help take care of this little boy. <clears throat> this was taken in in July of 2017, why did they flee? This uh, radical militant group was after him to join the group. And he was totally opposed to what they were doing, what they wanted to do. So he refused to join, and they threatened his family. He and his wife were both CPAs. They um, were apparently very wealthy in their country, had these two cute daughters. We were walking in the park, do, or we were prayer walking in the park one day and looking to see if there was someone we could help, minister to, love on, pray for. And I saw these two little <coughs> girls out playing, they're chasing pigeons, and they had a little bit of breadcrumbs, and they were feeding the, the pigeons, and they were being little, little girls. And um, the dad was standing there, and the look on his face, most of the looks you see are very sad. 
uh, despondent. And he was laughing at his school girls. And, I know, you know, some of you may be parents, and, you know, when you see your kids playing, it's, and they're laughing and giggling, and it's just, it makes you feel good inside. So we walked up to him and said, they're having fun. But he spoke great English, because I don't speak Arabic, I don't speak Farsi. <laughs> um, and he, was tell, he told us his story. And he said, I'd like for you to meet my wife. So they invited us back to this abandoned building where they're living in a little area, probably no bigger than right here, um, sleeping on the floor. And we met them, um, got to know them better. We took them out to dinner. Um, and, um, of course, we took the kids to get gelato. Uh, <laughs> and we were able to get them some clothing and just really love and minister to them. We sh did share the gospel with them. They... He said, I know, I've read the Bible before, um, but they're not believers. But just precious people. And the wife actually told me something which, I tell you, just uh, wiped me out. Because she said, um, I'm told that in order to get asylum, I need to look more like a tourist. Can you make me look more like a tourist? And um, I was really worried what she meant by that. But she wanted cropped pants, which she didn't have the money to get, and a nice blouse to wear so that she could look like a tourist. So we went shopping so she could look like a tourist. <laughs> this family is from Iraq. Um, we learned one day as we went into an abandoned building that there were three pregnant women, two of them they thought were in labor, and one was having a panic attack. So we had uh, there were two nurses there and a surgical assistant with me, and I said, well, you nurses go take care of that that might deliver right now because that's not my baby week. Um, I'll go talk to the one that's having a panic attack. So the surgical system and I went to talk to this lady. And when we got there, she was in such a, an absolute panic. She and her family had been living on the streets of Athens with her two sons. They had been there just a little over a week. Um, they had come through from Iraq through Turkey across the Aegean Sea. They were in the, had been in a camp. They'd gotten out of the camp pretty quickly. They'd gotten to Athens thinking everything was going to be great. And, <coughs> and now they're in one of those little rooms like this, sleeping on the floor. She's about seven and a half months pregnant. Her heart rate is... A little louder. A little louder, okay. Her heart rate is going like this. Um, so we checked her blood pressure, checked her heart rate. And I told her husband, I said, um, may I pray for her? And he said, yes. And I said, I want to pray for her in the name of Jesus because I know he's a healer and that the Holy Spirit can calm her. And he said, we know about his healing. And I said, okay. So we sat her down and started praying. And as we prayed, we were holding our finger on her pulse. And you could tell her pulse started slowing down. And <clears throat> um, about... Halfway through the prayer, she started sobbing. And she sobbed and she sobbed and she sobbed forever. And he used to say, we're all sobbing. He told the story that these um, radical militant groups um, firebombed the car that her parents were in, intentionally. His parent, their family was being targeted because of a relationship his brother had with the U.S. military. His brother and his wife and mother and father had gotten onto Germany. They, after they firebombed and killed her parents, they came to their home and burned their home with them in it. The little smaller child was burned on his legs and his stomach. Mom was burned as she tried to put the fire out. Um, he said, I wanted to stay and fight with everything that was in, within me, but I knew I had to leave and get my family to safety. So they left and came to Greece looking for hope. But they were in major despair. <laughs> Uh, when they got there because um, it takes a long time to get asylum in another country or even in, in Greece. And um, as he's telling the story, her heart rate is going down, she's calming down, her blood pressure is getting back to normal. And she starts telling us about the baby and she's excited about the baby coming. We got to know them, spent time with them, we bought some, got some vitamins for their kids and prenatal vitamins for mom. and. Um, we're able to get them some supplies from the store and um, help them. We took them out to eat, too, and I always go get ice cream 
uh, or candy for the kids. The dad kept saying, no, 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 don't do that for us. And I, we, we would tell him, you know, this is not from me. This is a gift from people, from your friends in America, but it's a, mainly a gift from God. Please accept this gift. And he would, but he, he was very worried about taking anything from us. And I asked him, I said, if it was me in this situation, would you give me something? And he said, oh, absolutely. And one day I'll pay you back. I said, no, just do something nice for somebody else. <laughs> so last year in May, I'm walking down the street and I get a tap on the shoulder. I've lost touch with him. I get a tap on the shoulder and all of a sudden this big bear hug. They found me. A year, almost a year later, they found me. We had lost touch. And look, that little baby we prayed for, that's him. Is he not the cutest? Uh, <laughs> oh, my. Um, and these two little boys, and they were all over the place. They were still in this one little room area that they'd, uh, they'd actually moved to another room, not much bigger. Um, and Went, he grabbed my arm and took me upstairs to see his wife, and she just cried and kissed, and Lord of mercy, she kissed all over us. Uh, we had two of others that had been there the year before, and um, the baby had some respiratory issues. Many of these places they live have problems with mold. <clears throat> and um, so we were able to get the baby some medicine. We bought diapers for the baby. We bought clothes for the kids and took them out, of course, out to eat and get gelato. Uh, we got the kids some little toys, and he was working on his paperwork to get them onto Germany. And they were they were getting close, but he lacked some money to get the paperwork. And I was sharing this with an email group that I have from my church, and somebody said, "How much do you need?" And um, so we were able to help them to pay for the paperwork. They may have to pay anywhere from five hundred to a thousand dollars for paperwork just to get them to the next step to to be granted asylum. So we've kept up with each other. They FaceTimed me, and um, <clears throat> they got to Germany in Jan late January and are reunited with his brother and sister in law and his parents. And now he told me about three weeks ago they actually have a home, and their parents live on the bottom floor, and they live on the top floor. So we still pray for this family. They're precious, and they want us to come see them. So the question, one of the questions I asked them over and over is, why in the world would you put your family in such a predicament? Why would you intentionally leave where you are? <clears throat> and there's a lady named Warsan Shire from Somalia who said it. No one puts their children on a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And that to me is true fear, that you would put your child on a boat, sometimes by themselves. <clears throat> this picture, I just hope you can see this. This picture, you may have seen this on the news. Um, it's a real, this is a real, these are real pictures. <laughs> these are not something somebody made up. But this little child was washed ashore because he fell out of the boat and his parents weren't able to get him. Why would you put a child unless the conditions back home were so bad that you didn't think you had a choice? <clears throat> this family, the couple in the middle, we met them um, this past year. Stephen and Kelly Halk on the ends there were out in the park one day praying, and they came on this family and started talking to them. They're very friendly. They, they always tell us, thank you, thank you, we love Americans, we love you, thank you for coming. And they got to talking with them. They sat down and had some tea, visiting with them, and yet they were distraught. They were one of those families that allowed their six-year-old daughter to go with some teachers to Germany because she had paperwork to go to Germany because the teacher had paperwork to go to Germany. They came out, They ended up not being able to go straight to Germany. They came to Greece, and they lost touch with their six-year-old daughter. And you can imagine the distraught that they had. Stephen and Kelly spent almost all week with this family, loving on them, praying for them, um, sharing with them, just pouring their heart out with them. And needless to say, we were all just um, in shock that this would happen. But it, it's one story of thousands of stories. Um, 
They were able to get um, asylum about six months later and go temporary asylum and go to Germany. They went to a camp in Germany, which is usually the first stop. They went to a camp in Germany, and of course, you know what they were doing. They were looking for their six-year-old daughter. And they kept asking people, do you know this girl? Do you know this girl? Here's her picture. And finally, about two months later, they found their daughter. Yeah. And mom had gotten pregnant in Greece, and the little girl was there for the delivery of her baby brother. This couple became believers while we were there in Greece. Uh, and they're now sharing the gospel, not only in Germany, but back home to their family in Afghanistan. So they walk for months through the forest. They ride on these little dinghy boats. These, some of these dinghy boats that I saw were maybe made for about 15 or 20 people, and they'll have 40 or 50 in there. They pay smugglers to get them across. They may pay $5,000, $10,000, whatever it takes to get their family across. Only the smuggler may not show up because you have to pay them ahead of time. The smuggler may not show up, so they lose their money. And then they have to get more money in order to get on the boat. People fall out of the boat, as you can see. This one's still like that. A lot of times, the life rafts that they have, they've taken gallon water, gallon, uh, water jugs, take the water out, put the lid on, and duct tape them to their arm. That's their flotation device to go across the Aegean Sea. Um, use those little floaties kids use to go across the sea. So many of them don't make it. They walk for days, months. They hide children in trees to keep them away from traffickers. Um, they carry their whatever they can carry in their arms. That's all they have their for early possessions. They leave everything behind. <clears throat> They live in refugee camps, which is typically the first place that they'll go. Um, this is actually a picture I took in a refugee camp back in the winter of 2016, where I literally froze to death. <laughs> but I couldn't complain because they, they were living in this freezing cold weather mm -hmm. in tents outside. Some of them, they will have a big container, like a, a big warehouse, where they'll put the tents inside the warehouse, so there's tents side by side. And the people do what they can to make a home. They invite us in. They'll go find somebody with some tea and want you to have a cup of tea with them. Very hospitable, very loving people. Many of them live in the parks when they first get to a country. Um, that's the only place they have they can find to live. So they're sleeping in the parks at night. This is um, another area that we visited with an abandoned building where there's about six families living in this one place in a big open area. They have a commun uh, common bathrooms and <clears throat> sort of bathrooms and a common place to cook. One of the things that I hear over and over is we're stuck. I actually had one guy tell me we are stuck in is the word limbo? I went, yeah, where did you hear that word? <laughs> he said we are stuck in limbo. We left thinking we we're gonna find get freedom from this persecution, and now we're treated sometimes like animals, and we're people. We want people to know that we are normal people, just like you and I. Mm. Very much dependent on the United Nations, on the countries that they land in. Uh, the, um, the whole asylum process, um, I'm not going to get into that, but it could take <clears throat> years. It could take literally three, four, five dozen interviews where they have to go in and get interviewed and are they appropriate to go to this country or that country. And I'm not saying that's wrong at all, but there are some things I think need to be tweaked with the way asylum works. Um, in some countries, there's a stipend that's given to them once they have official paperwork that they are a refugee, have a refugee status, they'll get some stipend, which is maybe enough to have at least one decent meal a day. Um, Sometimes, in some countries, such as the two families I told you about earlier, um, the, 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 with the little kids there, um, he is an engineer back home, certified engineer, been through college, master's degree, the other two are CPAs. So right now, they've been um, allowed to go to school in Germany and get a certification so he can be an engineer in Germany and they can be CPAs or at least accounting of some kind in Germany. 
how do we respond to this? Um, it's hard. <coughs> the first thing that I find from people in, in the states is that we are afraid because of where they come from, the countries they come from. They're not the same background maybe we are. Um, but we have to look at them, Anne's opinion, we have to look at them through God's eyes and through his heart and recognize that the tag refugee, yes, they, are, they have a status of refugee, but they're individual people. Their names are Ahmed, Muntaha, Ali. They have names. They're people. They, they're just like you and I. They truly are. And they love their families, and they want the best for their families. Most are, that I've met are very highly educated people. Um, most of them are much wealthier than I've ever been or ever will be. Um, and yet they've left everything to take care of their families. This situation, <laughs> the best thing to do is study. If you're interested in working with refugees, study about it. Go out on the internet. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Um, it's very complex, and there is no simple answer. I don't care what governments tell you, what politicians tell you. There's not a simple answer. Because how do you decide if this family goes or this family goes? How do you decide who gets asylum or not? Um, the ones I've met, most of them, I would bring them home. My husband, he dreads to hear from me at night after I've gone because it's like, okay, I'm bringing four families home with me. <laughs> um, it is definitely personal, spiritual, economical, and political. I'm absolutely convinced of that. So be engaged. Find out and be vocal. I, I came back from my first trip, and my senators and congressmen, they just get all kinds of emails and messages from me about what's happening in these countries and how can we as the United States help? What is it we can do? Um, go where they are. Do you know that there's a large group of refugees in Clarkston, Georgia? There's a large group of refugees up near um, Vanderbilt University, like 3,000 Kurdish people. Uh, outside of, uh, right in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, there's a large group of refugees that E3 works with. We've got refugees in San Diego, in Ohio, in Michigan, from all over the world, all over the world, that have come to our countries. There's places that you can go and serve and help, help meet the needs. Um, one of the big things is showing respect for people, which is true, I think, no matter what. It's showing respect for people and love and compassion. And if I could figure out what the solution was to the problems in their countries, I would be delighted to go try to help fix it. Uh, but they're big, big problems that these countries have and the reason that they're fleeing. And um, if you know a way to solve this, please start calling your congressmen, senators. <laughs> so I want to tell you a few ways that we've responded. This one was... Um, this one was one that was pretty emotional for me. Um, we were at, we were actually on Lesbos Island and um, had met a bunch of the refugees that had just come, come into the country and was working with another group from the United States and they had mapped out the camps. So every little strip here is a tent. It has a number and it has a label and it's got little sticky notes out to the side that tell what the basic needs are of the people in those camps. Are there babies there? Do they need diapers? Do they need formula? Do they have enough food? Do they have water? Do they have cl enough clothing for the winter? Um, <coughs> what is it that they need? And has somebody been in this, has somebody from the teams been in those particular tents? And have you had an opportunity to pray with people? What is it we can do to help? This was overwhelming to me because it was like, how are we going to do this? But it's one way that we serve. This little fella grabbed my heart. We were in a big warehouse that, they, that someone had donated, and a church from the United States came in and built this playhouse for the kids. And he was just shrinking. He was so excited and laughing and giggling and running because they were in the process of putting, they were had one area they were had an inventory of clothing and food supplies, another area where they were cooking, another area was a little library of children, of books that people had donated. Um, 
Another way is through a medical, going and helping with the health. Now, Greece has good medical attention, but they can't ha accommodate all the people that, that are there. So we work with the local Greek churches and local doctors to provide health care. This is a UAD nurse. And these handprints, the first time I saw them, I thought, what in the world is that? That is so neat, all these different handprints. And somebody, one of the refugees said, we want people to know that we are human. That's our handprint. And so we always, we say, yeah, that's saying, I see you. I see you. We know you're there. We know when we love you. We uh, partner with an organization called um, Instruments of Joy out of Franklin, Tennessee. M musicians donate instruments to them when they go buy a new one. And they clean them up and tune them up. And they donate them to ministries and churches to take uh, to missions. And so we took a guitar and um, gave it to one of the refugees that used to do, um, used to have a guitar back home, and he had to leave it when he left the country. That's just a few of the things that we do. Now, I want to introduce you to Iman. Um, Iman is from Iran. His name is Iman, Ron from Iran. <laughs> <laughs> and he has truly become a brother. Actually, he calls David and I, mom, my husband and I, mom and dad. Um, we met him in uh, early 2017, and he escaped when he became a believer because he is, was kicked out of his family and came over to Greece. And when he got there, God told him to stay. So when I asked him, well, what country do you want to go to? He said, right here. I'm here to serve the Farsi-speaking people of this country, the refugees who come here. And he's learned Arabic so he can minister to Arabic people, as well as he's learned some Greek. Uh, and he helps us arrange what we're doing now in Greece and minister with us. This family uh, is from Afghanistan. And when we were up talking to the lady that was having panic attacks, this lady was actually making tea for her um, and brought tea to her. And Iman said, man, look at his, the children's feet. And the heels of their feet were hanging off about that much off their shoes because their clothing and shoes are all donated. He said, can we do something? And I said, oh, yeah, we can do something. But there were 200 families in this building, and if you do one for one, you got to do one for everything, everyone. So I said, let's ask her to meet us down, downstairs about a block away, and we'll go do something. So we were able to take them and go to um, a little Chinese store down the street and got the little kids' shoes. See the little pink and blue shoes? They picked them out, and Mom approved, and we got Mom some shoes and some clothes to get them ready for winter. And he, you can see Mom's holding his finger up. <clears throat> he was telling her about Jesus. And um, we've been able to keep up, Iman's been able to keep up with her pretty well to see, make sure she's okay. This radical militia group was going into preschools and literally walking up to little kids and chopping their heads off for no reason. And so her husband helped her and the kids escape, but he didn't make it out. And so he's still at home. Hmm. Because people have been engaged, individuals going and groups going, I don't even, I can't even tell you the number of small discipleship groups that have started across all of Europe. Because if you start a group here and they move for asylum somewhere else, uh, new disciples are communicating. Who would have thought that iPhones and cell phones could be a communication vehicle for the gospel? But it is, because if someone becomes a believer, they're sharing this back home. <clears throat> this, that's the first handprints I saw in, um, in that big warehouse when we first got there. So gather your thoughts about what you can do. Uh, be willing to be engaged. Don't be afraid. Be willing to be engaged. I think that's really important. And don't just jump on a plane and go somewhere and say, I'm going to serve refugees. You can actually do that in most European countries, but it's better if you find a group to work with, a, ch a local church to work with, because they can help direct you to the right people um, that really, truly need your help. Uh, <clears throat> my first trip back, my second trip back from there, I was tossing and turning one night. My husband finally said, what is your problem? And I said, oh, I just had a nightmare. And I was actually on one of those dinghy boats, and I thought I was falling out with my kids. 
Um, and and he said, okay, sit up and take a deep breath. And I did, and I, I can remember telling him, I don't feel like I've made a trip in the ocean. And it's so frustrating because I am one of those that I am a fixer. You know, you got a problem, let's go get it fixed. And I can't fix this problem. And he said, Ann, one drip in the ocean will make a ripple. And you got two people making drips in the ocean. It's going to make a bigger ripple. So if you can do one thing, if you can help one family, if you can help one person, that's important. If you can show them that you're there because you love the Lord and because he sees them, they don't think anybody sees them. And you hear often on the news that um, most people in the world hate Americans. They love us. The people from these countries absolutely love us. They will come up and give you a, a total stranger, give us a big hug and kiss, cheek to cheek, cheek, cheek kiss. <clears throat> David Platt, who was a um, pastor at Church of Brook Hills and then president of the IMB for a while, he made a statement in 2016 that just grabbed my heart. He said, we have an unprecedented opportunity to respond intentionally to the spread of the gospel among refugees. And I, I started thinking about that, and what hit me was, uh, it's probably not in my best interest safety-wise to go to Syria or Afghanistan or Somalia, some of these countries. However, I can go to Greece. I can go to Germany. I can go to places where, I can go right here in the United States where refugees are. And I can serve people from countries that I'm not allowed to go into. Or for my safety's sake, it's best I not go into. This little lady right here, walking down in, into a camp when it was freezing cold, and she walked up and she said, you're welcome. And I said, thank you. And she, through a translator, I asked her where she was from. <clears throat> she was from Afghanistan. And she kissed my cheek, cheek to cheek, and she took my hands and she said, your hands are cold. I said, yeah, it's cold in here. And she started warming, warming my hands and telling me what a blessing it was, and I just met her, just because we went and showed some love and respect. This was displayed in a refugee camp. You speak to me with words, but I look at you with feelings. Whatever you say to me as someone in that situation, you're touching my heart. You're either showing respect or you're not. And when I saw that, this verse immediately popped into my mind. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And that's what I've seen um, with, with the, the people that I've been able to, to work with.